its regular practice. Oh, this is a different world. You, you can't relate to it. Some guys go crazy, they commit suicide. Other ones go through hate sessions. It's where hate feels like love. Where two correction officers were murdered in one day, the birth of the infamous lockdown, Marion, the birthplace of Supermax. They stand as monuments to America's get-tough attitude toward crime. The nation is dotted with prisons reserved for the most brutal and seemingly irredeemable convicts, prisons known ominously as Supermax. Proponents praise the jails as a powerful weapon in the war against crime. Critics claim the new breed of prison is creating a new breed of prisoner, angrier and more violent. And they warn most Supermax inmates will eventually be released perhaps coming soon to a neighborhood near yours. Tonight, Investigative Reports takes you on a rare trip behind bars, inside America's first so-called supermax. Our crews were granted remarkable freedom to look at an institution where freedom is in very short supply. Here near the small town of Merriam in southern Illinois lies one of the highest security prisons in the world. This is United States Penitentiary, Marion. Chains around my neck, on my legs, on my waist, they got me on a leash. Marion is the place where a new kind of prison was born. The Supermax, a unique security classification for a unique kind of prisoner. The toughest in America. Animals, plain and simple. Uh, would kill for the fun of killing. In 1978, the authorities transformed the prison into a maximum security environment. But to put America's most dangerous criminals together was a decision which was to lead to tragedy. Five years later, in 1983, a brutal chain of events led to the murders of two correctional officers and gave birth to the modern-day Supermax, as we know it. Today, most of Marion remains under lockdown 23 hours a day. This is its story. The very first prisons, like this one in Philadelphia, Eastern State, built in 1829, were based on the principle of one person per cell. Silence was enforced, and there was no possibility of association. Today's modern lockdown system used in America's maximum security prisons ironically reflects the earliest principles in penal history. John Greshner arrived at Marion in 1976 before lockdown started. He is serving a life sentence for first-degree murder. I've been a robber. I've been a drug dealer. I've been in shootouts. And I've been convicted of killing at least one person. I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to. I'm going to live my life on my terms. And these environments are jungles, man. However you characterize them, however you want to look at them, they're jungles, man. Until the late 70s, the Bureau of Prisons put prisons in five categories, from Category 1, the least secure, to Category 5, the most secure. In 1978, Marion became the first Category 6 prison in America, in which all the most dangerous prisoners would be locked up. The theory was that concentrating the most unmanageable inmates in one place would take pressure off other prisons in the system. Bo Harden worked as a correctional officer at Marion for 22 years. He remembers the days before 1978, when Marion had mainly operated as an institution for young offenders. Mostly young inmates, first-time bank robbers, uh, that kind of thing. Serious problems you didn't have. You had fist fights and arguments and fights over ball games. But it, 
changed and they uh, made it maximum security. They contacted them to us and we handled them. We kind of threw all the rotten apples in one big basket. And that's when the trouble started. The transformation of the prison in 1978 into a maximum security environment was a groundbreaking decision. Authorities called the prison a supermax, but it was very different to the supermax of today. The supermax of the 70s was a singular place where most inmates were allowed relative freedom to move around and to associate. But around the prison lay a security system fitting for America's most dangerous criminals. Dennis Kimmel arrived five years after Marion had been established as a supermax in the spring of 1983, just months before the correctional officers were murdered. He was transferred here for assaulting an inmate in another prison where he had been serving 25 years for bank robbery. The first thing I recall is all of the razor wire and all of the staff outside with guns and other staff at the door to meet everybody. And I looked down the long row of uh, razor wire, and geez, it was razor wire here, up this side of the inside of the fence, and up this side of the other fence. And then I saw the ground sensors, and I said, oh yeah, this is a real nice place here. John Greshner had been transferred to Marion from Minnesota State Prison in 1976 because the authorities felt that he was too dangerous to control in a normal prison. When I arrived at Marion, it was approximately 1.30 in the morning with all these escorts, state police escorts and all that, it's in the dead of winter. Marion was based around two main corridors radiating from a control center. All units on the east corridor were open, which meant the inmates could spend up to 10 hours out of their cells each day. But on the north corridor, there was one unit, each unit, in which the most disruptive inmates could be locked in their cells for up to 23 hours a day. They walked me in and they did a, a digital rectal exam. They got a PA working there. His little technique was, instead of just probing for contraband, he hooks his finger and digs in your colon trying to make you holler. But I ain't gonna make a sound. You can rip my guts out, I'm not saying nothing. They pulled a lot of stuff out of my record. They pulled it out of my mouth. They pulled the handcuff keys, narcotics, files, stuff like that out of my record. They pulled a, a hacksaw blade out of my nose. They pulled handcuff keys, stuff like that out of my mouth. Ron Crowder was transferred to Marion from a federal prison in 1982. He was transferred to Marion for the gang-related murder of another inmate. He had been serving a sentence for manslaughter he now faced a life sentence at Marion for first-degree murder. Well, I caught a murder case back in 82. A, a guy had disrespect us, and uh, we had to take care of what we had to take care of. And that was it. Oh, I killed him. I mean, it's no question. I took him out. Uh, and uh, they gave me life, gave me natural life, and uh, 10 years for the knife, you know. And I took him out, you know, had to. It was a must. You had to be respectful of everybody. If you disrespected somebody, even looking at them wrong could be a death sentence. Animals, plain and simple. Uh, would kill for the fun of killing. Didn't have to be mad at you. They just uh, wanted to keep a reputation up. Made them no difference why they would kill for a carton of candle cigarettes. They would kill for a sandwich or a piece of cake. Just for fun. I had never met people like them before in my life. The average person on the street won't believe you when you tell them. They don't think human beings can be that way. But believe me, they can. Everybody that was in Marion was there for a reason. You know, you got 350-some guys there. And out that 300, you might have 250 is there for killing. 
and other penitentiaries at that particular time. So basically what you had in Maryland was actually basically all gang members. Gangs, mostly based on racial allegiance, controlled drugs and other rackets. They asserted themselves through threats, intimidation, and assault. Murdering a member of a rival gang was known as making one's bones. Their presence was a guarantee of violence. Roger Ditterlein worked as a correctional officer at the prison for three years. He remembers keeping order within this gang-controlled environment as one of the most challenging aspects of the job. There was always gangs there. At that time, you had several types. You had the Aryan Brotherhood, the um, what we used to call the D.C. Blacks, Washington. Uh, there was even one group called the Cornbread Mafia that was somewhere around Georgia. Um, you had the uh, New Astra Familia and Latin Kings. You had all kinds of different gangs there, and usually, usually the ones that were at it most of the time were the um, Aryan Brotherhood and the D.C. Blacks. They, they were usually head-to-head -head most of the time. A lot of stabbings, a lot of killings over that. In the pre-lockdown period between 1978 and 1983, gang activity was made easier by Marion's open environment. For most inmates, days were spent out of cell, and inmates could associate in a variety of places. The chapel, the canteen, the prison workshops, and the prison recreation yards. The prisoners had access to one another as and when they wanted. The consequence was violence physical and sexual. In their language, you be my wife, it's just you and me. You refuse me and I'll turn the whole place loose on you. So these little guys that were scared to death of getting killed or raped by an entire cell house would take them what they called a daddy. He's my daddy, he takes care of me. They had no choice. I'm pretty much celibate. There was a time when I was not, and there was a time when uh, you would get smut books, or there would be homosexuals in the environment. They're homosexuals. And mostly they'd perform oral sex on me. <laughs> not, and I, I'm telling you, I didn't seek them out, they sought me out. Because they liked me. just like a couple. They went to the shower together, they went to a school class together and to work together, hand in hand. Nobody bothered him because he had his daddy with him. If he didn't cooperate, he belonged to everybody. The authorities at Merriam felt deprived of the ultimate sanction to prevent violence. In the 1970s, there was no death penalty for offenses committed inside federal prisons. Even murder was punishable only by the imposition of a further sentence. Since the average inmate at Marion was already expected to serve more than 40 years, there was little reason not to settle scores by violence. All a prisoner needed was the means. As far as having a weapon in the penitentiary, it's just like, you know, picking up a fork and a knife, you know? It's normal. You can make a weapon damn near out of anything, you know. You got to have a creative mind to get a weapon to protect yourself. You know, I mean, that's, that's the jungle. So therefore, you got to have something in order to protect yourself. I learned interesting tricks of the trade. I can now pop open a set of handcuffs with a, with a comb, plastic comb. I can make a handcuff key for a Smith & Wesson set of cuffs out of a ballpoint pen barrel. And it doesn't take me all day to do it either. And I can also cut through a solid steel bar with nothing more than dental floss and comet. You think, well, that would take a while. Yeah, but that's all they had, 24 hours a day. Um, need a knife? Oh, you got metal bed rails at that time. You draw your pattern with a pencil, make your initial cut with a razor blade, and just keep following that path over and over and over again. And in about 10 to 12 hours nonstop, it'll fall out. One of the inmates told me, he said, I've got 24 hours to figure out a way to get out of here. You've only got 8 to 10 to stop me. I 
primarily worked on their knives or shanks at night. They could sharpen this stuff on the concrete floor of their cell, and it, it's got its own little metallic sound late at night when everything's quiet. As an employee working there, you could hear this, but you couldn't get close to it. You couldn't move without them hearing you. You couldn't move without them seeing you. They would warn each other. You could not pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It was very difficult, next to impossible, to catch them in the act. A metallic, weird, in the middle of the night sound, frightening, because you knew what it was. I was working the corridor. When the emergency phone goes off, everybody who could runs to help. We got down there, and, and the gates are shut. You can't get to them. And it's very evident that two inmates had been stabbing another one. One of the inmates had already thrown his knife out to us, and the other one was told, bring your knife here, put it through the bars. And as he started to do that, the inmate who had been stabbed started trying to get up off the floor, and he was up on one knee and one foot up, and he was trying to pull himself up. The inmate said, wait just a minute. And he had a long, maybe 18 inches long, the heavy bale off of a mop bucket that he had straightened out and made an ice pick sort of thing out of. And he walked over to the inmate that was stabbed, put it right on the top of his head, pushed it down through him as far as it would go, pulled it out, brought it back and handed it to us and said, now you can have it. And he did this as calmly as, as you would go out here and shoot a rabid dog. It meant nothing to him. In pre-lockdown Marion, most prisoners only spent a long stretch of time in their cell at night. Each inmate had his own cell. During the day, they could spend up to 10 hours outside their cell, engaging in the other activities the prison provided. But this policy had unforeseen dangers. During this period, there were 10 group disturbances, 54 serious inmate-on-inmate -inmate assaults, 8 inmate-on-inmate -inmate murders, and 28 serious assaults on staff. The correctional officers felt they were being pushed to the limit. I hated going to work. I dreaded it. Say so you were a black man dropped in the middle of a Ku Klux Klan meeting, and you were forced to attend that meeting every day for 20, 30 years. I don't even know if that level of hatred and that level of abuse would measure up to what Marion was like. You're talking about a level six prison that was full of the most sociopathic, psychotic people you'd ever hope to meet. We went to work at the prison knowing there was certain dangers. The convicts would tell us every day, when they turn us out, heads are gonna roll. If you weren't scared, you were dummy, number one. You better be scared, you better be cautious. You knew at any time that they wanted you, they had you. If they want to kill you, they kill you. There's nothing you can do about it. Locking violent inmates away in supermax prisons does not come cheap. One of the newest high-tech and high-security jails is in southern Wisconsin. It comes complete with motion detectors, a moat, and an electrified fence. The $50 million prison is the latest step in a movement that began in 1983. For the most dangerous inmates, Marion had a special unit, H unit. It was divided into four tiers of cells, or ranges, A, B, C, and D. At the rear of B were double-fronted cells called boxcars, in which inmates were held in conditions of additional supervision and security. Whenever they left these cells, it was in handcuffs. 
and with an escort of three officers. One of the inmates held on B range was Tommy Silberstein. An armed robber from Long Beach, California, Tommy Silverstein had never killed anyone before coming to prison. But once inside prison, he joined the Aryan Brotherhood, a white supremacist prison gang, and was convicted of a gang-related murder. Now judged too dangerous to be housed in a normal prison, he was transferred to Marion in 1980 to serve a life sentence. Tommy Silverstein had the reputation as being a very, very serious and dangerous individual. And Tommy Silverstein can think, and that makes him more dangerous. He's a great person. He's got a great sense of humor. He's, he's a nice person. He'll give you the shirt off his back. Tommy was the most physically fit man I'd ever seen in my life. Not big muscles, but physically fit. I saw him work out for hours and hours and hours. I, I was a swamper or uh, janitor there for a while too. And he impressed me as an individual who you want to stay completely away from. Big guy, young, weightlifting type, strong, a leader. Uh, already had much more time than he was ever going to be able to do. Uh, all of us in this room probably couldn't live long enough to do it at the time he had. So he had nothing to fear by killing Gene Klutz. Gene Klutz, an officer with more than 20 years' experience at Marion, was nearing retirement in the summer of 1983. His last posting was on H unit. He felt very secure at his job. He was good at his job. Uh, they, uh, Somebody got mad at him, Silverstein got mad at him for something, and it didn't take much to make him mad at you. What happened was, when him and Klutz started beefing, just small, it turned into a personal thing, and it started building. And what happens after a while is every time that guard, Klutz, comes in, Silverstein's gonna be his toy for that eight hours. And every time Klutz comes in, Klutz is going to be the focus of all of Silverstein's negativity that he's building up in that cage. Silverstein hated Gene Klutz, hated him with a passion. Basically because Gene wouldn't give him um, all the things he thought he deserved, like two mattresses, two or three pillows, you know, more than his share of what was allowed, you know, in, in the institution. The institution allowed, you know, one, one, uh, one mattress, you know, one pillow, which is what they're allowed. He wanted two of the best of everything, and Gene wouldn't allow it. And so, you know, there was some animosity there. In 1988, Silverstein recorded his only ever interview from his specially built isolation cell deep in the bowels of Leavenworth Prison. He described how he felt about Gene Klutz. I told him, Klutz, listen. I got free everybody here. I don't lie in prison. You know, I'm not a punk little guy that you can smack around all the time. Don't you better get off my case, Clutch. You got something coming to you messing with me. You know, he just they're just that fuel of flame, he just wouldn't let me come back and laugh at me. It's just a personal thing with me and him. The morning of October twenty second, nineteen eighty three, dawned with no sign of the terrors to come. So it was just a normal day. And this is what was so shocking about this whole episode is that there was nothing out of the ordinary. The guards weren't nervous. The convicts weren't nervous. Of course, I don't know what Tommy was thinking about, uh, but there was no, you know, you wouldn't think anything unexpected like this was happening. It would be like living in California and you're watching a television program and all of a sudden the big one hits. You know it's going to come sooner or later. It's just like in prison. You know violence is going to occur sooner or later, but you don't really expect it. Even when it happens, you're shocked. At 11 a.m., inmate Tommy Silverstein was being escorted from his shower by three officers. Gene Klutz, 
Bill McClellan, and John Mahan. It started off as basically just one more escort or move of an inmate. Uh, perhaps, you know, it was um, regimental to us. We had done it hundreds of times. Uh, uh, one, one does something repetitious, often you get a lax. Silverstein suddenly accelerated away, moving up to the cell of a fellow inmate, Randy Gomez. He placed his cuffs in the hatch of Gomez's cell, who opened them with an improvised key. Gomez then passed Silverstein a homemade knife or shank. First and foremost, I thought of my own safety. Because, uh, you know, I realize here we are in a somewhat confined area, a small hallway quarter that's, you know, five feet wide roughly and um, 40 feet or so long. And we're behind Silverstein now with a, with a, a shank. You know, so my safety, I stepped out of the way. When he come running out of Gomez's cell, I stepped out of his way. Silverstein turned back and made straight for Klutz. When he began to come, he freezes. He's just standing there looking at me. I just go all the way up and start stabbing me. I'm not hearing nothing. All that's just his hands moving and he's stabbing me. It's just everything just goes blank. I heard a commotion. And, of course, I'm watching TV and I'm not paying much attention, but then I started hearing some real bad commotions, screaming, in fact. They led the one off officer, Klutz, the one that got stabbed first. They led him out and, you know, his shirt was in rags. I think Tommy had hit him 25 or 30 times, just like that. Gene Klutz was taken to Marion Memorial Hospital, where he was pronounced dead just before noon. He had been stabbed 38 times. I consider Gene a good officer and a friend, and uh, it was uh, it was devastating. You know, um, didn't didn't have to happen, didn't shouldn't have happened, and uh, quite uh, quite honestly, it uh, it still bothers me. And you know, I often often wonder is there anything that uh, perhaps I could have done different. Um, I realize that there's not, but uh, but I get, you know, persons still get asked asked that question quite regularly. Gene was a good man, family man, country boy. Grew up around here, had his little farm. Looks forward to uh, farming part time, playing with his grandkids, and grown old right here in Southern Illinois. Just didn't make it. But Gene Klutz was only the first officer to be murdered in Marion that day. In another isolated incident matching the Silverstein killing in almost every detail, a second officer, Robert Hoffman, was killed while escorting an inmate in another part of H Unit. Carlson, the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, was asleep in his weekend cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, this particular October night, uh, uh, we were both asleep. Uh, uh, the phone call came into one of our neighbors. We didn't have a telephone at the time. Uh, the neighbor came over to our cabin and uh, alerted me to the fact that I was wanted on the telephone immediately because there had been an officer killed at Marion. That was the first officer. Uh, then, of course, several hours later, I received a second call, uh, which was obviously very disturbing, uh, even more so than the first, because here two officers had lost their lives within a matter of hours uh, at supposedly the most maximum security prison in the federal prison system. Well, I immediately went home, obviously. Uh, it was the middle of the night, but I did drive home and contacted other staff.
a number of people uh, joined me in the central office then immediately, and uh, we started to, to plot a course of action as to what we could do to deal with that situation. There was a low point, uh, without a doubt, in, in that institution, and I would suspect it was probably the lowest point in the history of the Bureau of Prisons that particular day, that particular series of days that, that occurred uh, after the, uh, the two officers were killed. Norman Carlson's next step was to send to Marion an elite unit with tactics recently devised to deal with violent inmates. The Special Operations Response, or SORT team. Its leader was Jim Grimm. I went and I talked to some people and then they said they would go and all that. So then uh, they sent us home, we packed our bags. We flew out that afternoon into the Marion. On arrival, the sort team made it clear to the prisoners that they would regain control of the institution by whatever means it took. The more the prisoners fought back, the more they would be put down. Over the course of the next three months, they fulfilled their mission. used almost every case because most of them felt like if they submitted and was nice guys and came out of their cells peacefully that then they were sissies in the eyes of the rest of them so they had to come out and swing at you kick at you hit you with something they had to put on their show at marion the sort team's task was systematically to remove every inmate from his cell and then to search the inmate and his cell thoroughly for weapons or potential weapons. It wasn't that nice because they stripped all of us down and shook us down for weapons or uh, taking our personal property of our loved ones and things of that nature, just throwed it out on the floor. They was whipping people, uh, having people standing out there in front of the cell, butt ball naked. <laughs> The sort team's preferred method, as shown in the footage shot at Marion in the months after the killings, was the so-called five-man move. You got five people, basically. Now, the first person that goes in, his job is to hit the person here in the chest area and to drive him back to the first stationary object. Hopefully, that's a wall. The second person going in, his job is to grab the right arm. That's his sole purpose, and he's got a set of handcuffs with him. And then the third person going in, he's going after that left arm there. And then the fourth and fifth man, One's going for the left leg, and one's going for the right leg, and the fifth man's got a set of leg irons. Then you put him down to the floor, you roll him to the right, and why I'm say I got the right hand, I'm taking it up behind the back, putting a handcuff, this guy's going here, bring that left arm up there, and they're handcuffing him right there together. And simultaneously, there's two people working on his legs, bringing him up, putting leg irons on him. And nobody can say anything. Then the show's over. So they come through there and uh, took all the metal off the wall, you know, for you. When you plugged your electronics in, you know, like the buffer, things like that, just took all the metal out the joint, things like that. So when they found out that they had control over you, it was over with. Some of the most disruptive inmates were actually chained to their beds for short periods. But the shakedown was just a prelude to a far more radical retaking of Marion. Because from shakedown came lockdown. The lockdown was a response to the killing of two guards. It was initially introduced as a temporary measure. But to this day, it remains in place on several of Marion's units. 
A lockdown is, is a phrase, I guess, that is used to uh, describe an institution where inmates uh, uh, do not have access to any other part of the institution. They are locked in their cells essentially all the time. Uh, the, there may be a you know, limited opportunity to take a shower, uh, to go to the recreation yard for an hour or so, but for at least 23 hours a day they are kept within the confines of their immediate cell. The whole prison became locked down. The whole prison. They locked it down because they said, okay, well, we got two officers the same day. So that's what happened. At United States Penitentiary Marion, the prison had returned to the first principles of the American prison system. Confined in their cells, Marion's inmates now endured the very conditions which the founders of Eastern State, the first prison, had envisioned. Isolation falls, uh, especially being in Marion, you know, uh, this when you are being tested. You got to be strong mentally because, I mean, this is 24-7 lockdown. If you don't have yourself together mentally, you, you would, it would eat you up. Marion is no joke because uh, I done seen too many people go crazy. I had a couple of close friends that I seen different little changes in their personality that they won their self. You know, they weren't doing the things that they normally do. I mean, hell, Mary might have had an effect on me. I don't know. For those who endure lockdown conditions of 23 hours a day in a cell, life can be almost unbearable. You know, I've heard people say, Gresner, how can you handle this? Some guys go crazy, they commit suicide. Some guys go crazy, commit homicide. Other ones go through hate sessions. It's where hate feels like love, and they have these visions of hate. I've been through the whole journey. I've been through the homicidal rages. Uh, I've been through points in my life, deep in the pit, it's like the dark night of the soul, where I says, you know what? If this doesn't get better, I'm gonna get my hand Since 1983, the lockdown has been relaxed in some of Marion's units. But the isolation model has been imitated across America. There are now more than 20,000 prisoners held in so-called modern... The day that I'm going to meet Silverstein, I have three burly guards there, and they all have nightsticks, and the associate warden, and he says, are you ready? And we start down, we go through three solid steel locked doors, and when I say basement, what I really mean is almost a dungeon. This is like going down several levels into 
the very bowels of Leavenworth. And we get down there and we go through another steel door and we're in this totally white room with this bright fluorescent light. And there's monitors on the wall and that's my first glimpse of Silverstein. Now this guy, Silverstein, has not been given a razor, a comb, a brush, or a mirror because of security precautions. So my first glimpse of him is on this small screen and here is this guy who looks like a Neanderthal man. He has hair coming all the way down to his shoulders and this unkept beard. And he's under these bright lights. He looks like an animal in here. His cell has video cameras watching him, which are constant surveillance. And because they're video cameras, the justification of the Bureau of Prisons is that the lights have to be on 24 hours a day. Um, I sit down. They leave, uh, and I get my first chance to talk to this man who from 1983 to 1987 has only seen correctional officers uh, or bureau psychologists. No friends, no family, no outside visitors except for a preacher that they had sent down to see him occasionally. Pete Hurley spent 19 hours with Silverstein, tape recording every conversation. They talked about his entire life, including the murder of Klutz. I don't know, mixed feelings. I still got him. I still claim him by him. I don't know. I just wish it had never happened. You know, I mean, the whole thing, the whole, the whole thing goes over and over. The Bureau of Prisons has assigned Silverstein a special status. No human contact. Like a dog. More than 40 of America's states have now built supermax prisons, and the Federal Bureau of Prisons have built an even more secure and updated supermax at Florence, Colorado. All have their origins in those events of October 1983 at Marion. The supermax is a controversial institution. Its critics argue that it makes already violent men more violent. Its supporters argue that such men have proved unmanageable in any other conditions. What can be stated as fact is that there have been no guards murdered at Marion since the 1983 lockdown was put in place.